Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Early Music Podcast. My name is Darina Ablogina, and this season holds something truly extraordinary as we dive into the heart of the Early Music Summit. How can we embrace the bigger picture of research, education, performance, and creation? How will we redefine our field in a more open, inclusive, and balanced world? Join us in shaping the future of the early music scene with the Early Music Summit. And today my guest is... I'm Raphael Pichon. I'm 38 years old. I'm a conductor. I founded my own group. This group is a choir and an orchestra playing on paired instruments. We started already almost 20 years ago. I had the chance to discover music, let's say, totally by accident when I was nine, eight or nine. And I joined, I sang in a boys choir. And it was a huge shock. And I was, I was a violinist. I was a pianist. I sang a lot. And I started my professional life as a singer. But I wanted, since I'm 15 or 16, I really wanted to, yeah, to start my, my own story, my own journey, my own adventure with musicians around me. Now, 20 years after, we dedicated a lot on early music. Uh, we started especially with Johann Sebastian Bach or with Jean-Philippe Rameau. And now our repertoire is really wider. Uh, we also play uh, classical music, also romantic music. We will start also new projects with new music, with commissions. Let's say we mm, try to also imagine a lot about how to present our music in front of the audience today, in the world of today, in the world where the world is changing a lot, of course, and and classical music needs to, yeah, to embrace a lot these new realities and it's it's really uh, it's really exciting to think about form about the form of the concert the form of our performances about our the opera world about our venues really exciting new questions for us as a young musician and also to face these new realities where it's not so easy all the time to to continue with classical music. And uh, I think it's a really interesting, exciting uh, period for classical music about innovation, about legacy, about many different questions. It's great that you already touched on each of the subjects. As an artist, you can see this link uh, between historical repertoire that has been studied, understood, and this subject of appropriation is very interesting. For instance, as you mentioned, you did all these very famous pieces like B minor mass and Ramon and the others. How do you see this problem of reappropriation? How do you see the situation where musicians, they record the same piece over and over again? I think there is different layers in, in this question. I think there is a first conclusion. Uh, the, the world was totally different. All these people, all these generations like Nicolas Harnoncourt, Jean-Claude Malgoire, um, William Christie, um, and so many others, Jordi Saval, their choice, what is the essence of what all this repertoire, all this patrimony could tell us today, they had to fight they had to accept as a huge sacrifice, re-embrace in a totally different way, um, speaking about technical way, uh, speaking about even a philosophical way, the experience of being a musician was totally different. We didn't have as young musicians to experiment any sacrifice. I grew up in a context where I learned so much from concerts, from recordings, from books, from teachers. We understood that uh, the realities of time, of the music history, didn't say exactly the truth. There was a lot of masterpieces hidden in our memories. 
But that's true that if you start a project today with the credo, let's rediscover the repertoire, it's not anymore a reality. Because now we are more facing, I think, moments where we think there is a kind of fight to continue with that, which is not really true. I'm not sure there is still a lot of really interesting music to rediscover. Perhaps in the Renaissance era, for sure. 15th century, 16th century, even a bit in the 17th century, of course. So as you said, what do we do with the repertoire today? And I think the next step is also to face the fact that these generations gave us a lot of new tools of how to try to reveal this repertoire. Harnoko said how to wake up these atrophied cells of this repertoire. I really think now that we could absolutely understand the, the interpretation of the 70s is not at all the, the, the interpretation of the 80s, of the 90s, of the, you know what I mean? Like now, the reality is that despite this Baroque revolution, where there was sometimes a, a fake fight about authenticity or about all this idea of truth, which is really dangerous, now, it's really clear that each generation is developing its own way of interpretation. We embrace this repertoire in a, in, a, in a still really fresh way, I think. So there is still something really essential, really interesting to continue to play all these masterpieces. It's not so easy to touch the audience with these masterpieces if we are not thinking about where we present them. Classical music is, is now trying to survive in an ocean of music. There is different challenges. Um, how to shout as loud as possible that all these masterpieces are, are life-changing, are able to feed us in a unique way. So you mentioned this responsibility that we have as young musicians. So how do you describe that, how the perspective changed and what are actually the responsibilities of the new generations? Since the start, the question of the identity was something essential. The repertoire is not enough. The quality is not enough. The question of honesty the question of generosity, the question of objectivity, but at the same time of huge personality is, is, some, is something crucial. This uh, uh, feeling of responsibility is absolutely clear. Each choice, each program, I would say even since the COVID, each concert is a challenge. We need to convince that the audience will welcome 
this program, the, the hole will be full. You know, all the parameters around us. So it's great. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's necessary. And you spoke about the honesty. Uh, which kind of honesty do you mean? I mean a kind of philosophical um, honesty. You play a piece because you deeply believe in the message uh, this piece is trying to deliver. Mm -hmm. But how can you know for sure what it is about? You will not know. You don't know. Of course, you're not. You're not sure of it. It's your intuition, your conviction in the moment. But um, it's more a question of relationship with the with the repertoire, with the piece. How do you see the enlarging of the repertoire and enlarging the quality or enriching the quality? From my side, so impressed. Discover really younger musicians, musicians in their twenties now. It's amazing. I mean, the, the uh, technical abilities, sometimes the knowledge, the ability also to understand really clearly what is, I don't know, like, like uh, a violin renaissance practice facing um, early Baroque uh, violin practice. And the, the, technical, the technical level changed so much since 30 years. Early music is not anymore since quite a long time now, something on the side. It's a kind of mainstream. That's, that's fantastic news. There is a lot, a lot of young musicians convinced about the, the richness of early music practice. And we would like now to start a career. So it means that, yes, the quality is not enough because there is so much amazing players. The repertoire is not enough because you will not come with a new masterpiece that no one knows. The focus is somewhere else. Perhaps also sometimes questions of innovation, open mind, your ability also to, to create more bridges in this classical music and other art forms. And I started already 20 years ago and everything's changed totally since 20 years too. As you mentioned also, and I agree, there are so many young musicians and they are amazing. The market is oversaturated in a way and the repertoire is not enough. So it's like a snake eating its own tail in a way. What do you think about the dynamic on the market? Yes, I think that's absolutely true. In the 80s and 90s, the government um, welcomed a lot of new groups, new ensembles. These groups and ensembles are still playing now. We had the chance with Pygmalion, for instance, be also welcomed, not exactly in the same way, but still welcomed by the government to be supported. And now that's absolutely clear that classical music is something which uh, creates fear for the political figures in France. It means that it's more and more difficult for the young generation to start their own project. And it's a paradox because this young generation, for me, seems to be really more conscious about what the world needs. I'm not sure that the next years will be more easy. I think it's the opposite. Post-COVID new realities, even harder. Because you're absolutely right. That's perfectly true that it's oversaturated. It's endless the way to accept pure freedom to imagine new ways of presenting it without losing the essence of this music, which is to be presented also in a quite classical manner in front of an audience in a concert hall with a cohabitation of many different aesthetics question of richness of vocabularies, grammaries, of, of, um, uh, of expressions is crucial for me. And perhaps also, I think it will create more and more motivations to imagine new music, but now written for 
bird instruments. I also believe there is quite a new world to explore. When you when you meet a composer, you present to him all these possibilities of colors, of timbers, of of, of sound worlds. Of it's like for him, it's most of the time it's like to enter a new cosmos or a new galaxy of sounds. There is no limit. There is still a lot to explore. Do you have this feeling of a bubble? And do you feel it from inside that early music field or classical music field? It is a bubble in a way. And do you feel a bit disconnected from the real world inside of this bubble? Of course, it's a bubble. But this bubble for me is not disconnected from the real world. The most important bubble in this bubble is the freelance, independent world quite a lot of crucial differences between a permanent orchestra, an institution, and an ephemere group developing a project. I think that it's a paradox. The independent projects and groups since 20 years seems for me first artists in classical music who faced the realities of the world, who worked a lot about how to connect people, how to create this really small, compact manifestation like small festivals everywhere in the countryside, in the industrial venue, how we are able to imagine novel crossover, how to create bridges with um, different art forms. It's more about how as a collective how the entire bubble could now absolutely accept to continue this mutation. But, but for me, the main, the main thing is that there is a paradox. I think that a lot, a lot, a lot of musicians from the young generations or even from the older generations, they proved so much their ability to stay deeply connected to the real world. That's the problem. Thank you very much, Rafael Pichon. As we look to the future, we are excited to explore the innovations that await us in our field. This podcast series is a prelude to the Early Music Summit that will take place at Bazaar and Concertgebouw Bruges from November the 30th to December the 3rd of 2023. Stay tuned for our upcoming episodes. Our next episode is going to be about influences of research on the market. on the exciting discussions and discoveries that are ahead. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, keep exploring the boundless horizons of early music.